Hello, this week, SharePoint was affected by cyber attack, undetectable malware was discovered, and the FBI issued a public service announcement warning about a specific email scam that's been taking the, the world by storm over the last few years. Uh, tech news this week was hot, so for this week's ITNet update, I'm gonna be taking a deep dive into some of the news articles uh, that you and your company need to be aware of uh, to be able to protect yourself from similar attacks. Hello, I'm Michael Kinnett, CEO and founder of Itronal Networks. And every Friday at 1 p.m. Pacific time on our Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and my personal LinkedIn pages, I go live to discuss the latest tech and cyberspace news that might affect you and your business. At the end of my live session, I'll make sure to answer questions from the audience. So if you have any uh, business tech or cybersecurity questions or comments, get them ready. I'll be uh, responding to them uh, at the end today. So I've got, I've got three articles that I'm gonna kind of highlight uh, and talk about um, what they talk about. I'm going to share some information about them. The first of which uh, is a SaaS or software as a service ransomware attack that hit SharePoint online without using a compromised endpoint. Now, the reason that this is this is a big deal is because typically these type of attacks come from a compromised endpoint. So a, a workstation, an end user's computer gets infected and from there the criminals, the threat actors are able to then spread to SharePoint online. Um, but this this attack was detected and was was happened without a compromised endpoint. Uh, cybersecurity firm Obsidian uh, shared the information about this attack. Uh, one of their clients, they were they were hired to help investigate and uh, re resolve the issues with this. Uh, so the the end user, the client, the company that was affected was not shared but Obsidian shared information about the attack uh, to make other businesses aware of the risks. And so th this business was, uh, their SharePoint Online, which is through Microsoft 365, was attacked, was compromised via a Microsoft global admin account, rather than the more usual route of a compromised endpoint, as I mentioned. Uh, so this is another case of insider threat being an, an entry point for, for criminal hackers, right? So. Once in, the attacker created a new user called Omega uh, with elevated privileges, including global admin. So it gave them, uh, basically they created a new user for themselves with full rights to everything. Uh, and once they had that, they then removed all of the existing administrators. And for this company, that was more than 200. Uh, they did that over a two hour period. Uh, Obsidian suspects that this is probably the beginning of a trend, and I, I would agree with the data that, that they shared. The attacker spent a significant amount of time building out automation to perform this attack, which implies the desire to reuse it and to um, basically have these type of attacks again in the future on other companies. There's also a lot less businesses out there that are protecting their SaaS, that have strong SaaS security in place. But many companies, and this is great, right? Many companies are very well invested in endpoint security, right? So they're, they're buying the endpoint security product and protecting their endpoints. So it's getting harder for criminals to get in through that point. Uh, but they found another, another way and we, we do expect to see more and more of that. So another thing that, that, that this attack did, that's another, another trend that we're seeing in the industry is, is instead of encrypting the SaaS data, on SharePoint Online, they downloaded it. So they downloaded the data and then they uploaded a bunch of files basically saying, hey, if you want your data back, um, here's, here's what you're gonna do. So this business was completely down, right? They lost access to all of their SharePoint data. They lost access to their admin accounts to go in and even recover. This was a major, major disaster for them. And so you may, you may think, okay, well, what, what could they have done to protect themselves, right? And, and the obvious uh, first thing that we would say is, well, they should have been using MFA, right? Multi-factor authentication. I've talked about it on my streams in the past. We've done webinars on it, on the importance of MFA. That's, that's true, right? MFA should be enabled preferably for all accounts, but especially for any admin or highly privileged accounts. However, even MFA is not a perfect protection against this type of thing. 
Um, threat actors are able to get credentials and find credentials on the dark web and through other breaches. Um, to, they can purchase them. And so acquiring a username and password is, is the first step uh, that these criminals do, right? As they try to get in with that. If there's, if there's MFA in place, then they can't get in unless they can gain access to the MFA. And they do have, we're seeing more and more of these, these hackers that are doing um, attacks um, where they're doing MFA push fatigue attacks, where they're trying to log in and trying to get your authenticator to pop up and say, hey, are you trying to sign in? And they do it over and over and over where the end user's like, yes, I'm trying to work and they approve it, giving that, that attacker access to the system. So uh, criminals have ways around MFA. It is more difficult and there are ways to train on how to identify um, and look at that. But MFA in this case may or may not have solved you know, and protected this organization. Uh, ultimately, uh, businesses need to further harden their environments by using other technologies through SaaS, application monitoring, threat monitoring, uh, conditional access. I did a, I did a live uh, update back in March on conditional access, um, which would help protect your business from incidents like these. And I'll, I'll make sure we, in the, in the chat, we get a link uh, to that live stream talking about that one from, from March. But ultimately, you know, you need MFA enabled and you need some sort of system monitoring your SaaS applications. Now for, for our clients that we manage their cybersecurity, I can, I can describe what we do. Um, and if you have questions about it, you can talk to us. Uh, if you have in-house IT, I would talk to them about implementing it. But essentially we, we monitor things out of the ordinary, similar to conditional access, right? We use some conditional access and some other tools. And so we look and see, okay, well, where are they signing in from? If the, if the company's in Nevada and somebody's trying to sign in from Mexico or from the Middle East somewhere or from Russia or Europe or Asia, right? Is that normal? I'm like, no, we wanna know about that, right? We wanna know um, what's going on. And so we monitor for that, we get alerted if there's sign-ins outside of the normal area. And if we see sign-ins outside of the nor normal area with other kind of key indicators, we have automation in place that locks that account, forces log out, and, and does certain things to automatically protect that account. So there's some, there's some, definitely some automations that can be put in place and monitoring that should be put into place to let you know about these things. You should know if a new admin account is created. Uh, that's that's another given, right? Know that when a new admin account is created, know when an admin account is deleted, know when there's new logins outside of your area. Um, by monitoring all these things, you're able to, to, if not protect yourself from these type of attacks, at least be able to respond quickly and minimize the damage. All right, uh, the next article, the next headline, and this is this is a fun one. This one's definitely a little bit, a little bit different. And so, uh, cyber criminals have been using. It's called bat cloak, but it's a uh, a FUD, which is a fully undetectable malware obfuscation engine. Uh, it's they ca it's called bat cloak. It's been it's been out in production since September of 2022, and it's it's used to deploy various different malware strains, and has the ability to evade antivirus detection. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about um, what what this software does. So uh, obf obfuscation uh, basically makes the code look very confusing. So uh, either automation applications or even humans looking at that code are not able to tell what it's trying to do. It makes it more difficult to say, hey, this is malicious software. Um, or this is clean software because of, of how this engine basically rewrites the code to deploy it. And it's able to then embed other things like malware strains inside it and deploy those things in, in a way that antivirus is not able to detect it. So about 79, almost 80% of the, the total 784 artifacts that have been unearthed using this, this tool have no detection across all the security solutions tested. Uh, that's that's a huge number, right? There, there are literally dozens and dozens of security vendors out there and for them to be tested and, and almost 80% of these artifacts 
to not be detected. Uh, that's a big deal, right? That that highlights Batcloak's ability to circumvent these traditional detected detection mechanisms. And, and so this Batcloak engine is kind of the the crux of an off-the-shelf batch file builder tool. And I don't want to get too deep into the weeds on the technical stuff, but essentially it it, it embeds these capabilities to bypass anti hour scan interfaces as well as um, you know, compressing and encrypting the payload to be able to evade the security and to deploy it. Uh, it was, it's an open source tool. Uh, it has been taken offline. It was made available on, on GitHub and GitLab in September 2022 and was advertised on there. It was taken down, it was taken offline, but prior to that happening, it's been cloned and modified by other actors and, and ported to different languages uh, such as Rust. It's been it's received several updates since it first came out and adaptations. The the most recent version is called ScrubCrypt. Um, Fortinet uh, Fortigard Labs has recently highlighted it, talked about it in connection with a crypto jacking operation that was mounted by a, a criminal organization uh, recently. And the the evolution of the software really underscores the flexibility and adaptability um, of of engines like this you know, these FUD batch obfuscators and shows that, you know, these criminals, are, they're pretty smart. They're pretty sharp and they're they're continually finding ways to get around security. Um, and so you may ask, well, what's what can I do to protect myself from this? Well, you, we talk, I've talked about this before, layers of security, right? You need layers of security. If the only security you have in your, in your organization or on your computer is an antivirus program, guess what? you have some risk there. You need to have layers of protection um, to be able to monitor and, and detect and protect yourself. And then and you also have to have backup and other systems in place to be able to recover if something does get through. All right, the next uh, thing I wanna talk about today, this is a public service announcement that was issued by the FBI this last week, uh, talking about business email compromise or BEC. We've talked about this a little bit before as well, um, but BEC, Business Email Compromise, is a sophisticated scam that targets both businesses and individuals who perform legitimate transfer of fund requests. It's frequently carried out when an individual, uh, a threat actor, compromises a person's or a company's business or personal email account. And that can be done through social engineering, uh, through computer intrusion, right through their endpoint. But essentially they gain access to this email account or this email system. They then monitor what's going on and they, they might sit there with access for weeks or even months watching for the perfect opportunity to conduct this BEC scam. And what they do is they, they look for the right type of email in order to then conduct these unauthorized transfers of funds. Um, the, I, I should point out the scam is not always associated with transfer fund requests. However, that's typically what it is. Um, sometimes it requests, you know, they're, they're, they're after personally identifiable information, wage and tax information, W-2 forms, cryptocurrency wallets, etc. But typically it's related to, to transfers of funds. So they, they sit on these accounts until they see uh, a vendor saying, hey, you know, here's here's your invoice. You can send us payments so we can ship the product to you. Uh, and at that point, the, the threat actor then modifies those emails, injects themselves in between and redirects where that payment goes through this uh, this BEC, through this business email compromise so that those funds actually get wired instead of to the vendor, whoever you're purchasing stuff from, it goes to the criminal. So I do want to share some statistics that the FBI shared here. Um, and this is from filings that they've received um, with financial institutions between October 2013 and December 2022. So uh, this is domestic and international, right? So there's been, uh, I'll just share some of these numbers with you because some of these numbers are staggering. So over a, you know, nine, just over a nine year period, there were 277,918 domestic and international incidents that the FBI was made aware of. Um, of those, that, that amounted to a $50 billion 
$871,249,501 in losses as a result of these, these business email compromises. Um, the, if we want to look at just the U.S. side of things, right, the, the total U.S. victims that the FBI was aware of in that same time period, 137,601 victims. And the total U.S. exposed dollar loss was $17,328,435,141. Um, with the remaining of the, the victims and, uh, and dollar amounts being outside of the U.S. So uh, another thing that the FBI pointed out is that these BEC scams targeting the real estate sector are on the rise. I'm, I'm showing you this is this is the numbers. Um, from the FBI PSA talking about this. And this is showing from, you can see from 2015 to 2022, you can see the amount of, of victims that are in the real estate market. So there's a 27% increase from 2020 to 2020, 2022. Um, and during that same time period, there was a 72% increase in losses in the real estate uh, nexus with B from BECs. So uh, there's a significant you know, increase both in the amount of attacks and in the amount being lost by real estate companies that are affected uh, by this. And this also could be, you know, could be contributed to the rise in real estate costs over the last several years, right? As real estate has gone up, um, those transaction amounts are going up. So, it, you know, that could lead to an increase in the total dollar value um, as well. The FBI did issue some suggestions for protection. I'll share those, I'm gonna add some of my own as well. Um, they suggest using secondary channels or 2FA to verify requests for changes in account information. And that includes you know, bank account information for wiring, um, any payment information, PII information, right? Finding, having some sort of two-factor or secondary channel to verify before making that change. Uh, making sure that the URL and emails is associated with the business or individual it claims to be from. One of the common things that these, these uh, BEC threat actors do is they will register a domain that's very similar to either, either the victim or the vendor that they're communicating with and basically inject themselves into that conversation with a similar email with a slightly different domain. And so it's important that you look at the, the email, you know, the domain, and make sure that it's not, hasn't changed at all from the beginning of your conversation or from what you have on your records. Also, you need to, to be alert to any hyperlinks um, in the emails. And this is just good for phishing, right? Testing, training, right? To know, be aware. But look at the hyperlinks. Where do they go? Uh, look at any misspellings um, of the actual domain name, right? Is it is it exactly what you would expect it to be? Is there an extra letter or is there a letter missing? <coughs> so be aware of that. Another tip, refrain from supplying any login credentials or PII of any sort via email. Uh, many emails request your personal information may appear to be legitimate. However, you know, you're, you're exposing yourself because even if it is legitimate, if who you're communicating with is compromised at that point or at any point in the future, that information is then compromised as well. Um, another thing to do is, uh, and this, especially when you're on a mobile phone, it's a little bit harder to do, but but look closely, right, at these e at the email addresses, at the URLs, at the domains and all this stuff to make sure it matches um, who it's coming from. And another thing that's important is to monitor your, your financial accounts on a regular basis for any irregularities, such as missing deposits, um, or transactions that you expect to see there that are are not there because um, that's another indication that maybe some, maybe one of these compromises has occurred. I, I do want I think I mentioned this a few weeks ago. I was at a cybersecurity conference in Nashville and uh, a special agent with the FBI cybersecurity division uh, based out of the Memphis office was there um, talking about uh, BEC and, and as well as other threats. And he pointed out that if you are a victim of a business email compromise that leads to a loss, the faster you get the FBI involved, the better. Um, you have about a 72 hour window from the time that that transfer occurs to be able to recover it. Uh, the FBI 
has a 72% recovery rate within that 72 hour window of being able to stop that, that transfer and getting your funds back. Um, that also helps them collect evidence and information to go after these criminals. Uh, if, you, if you don't detect that for more than 72 hours, still get them involved as soon as you can. Um, but just know that the longer, the longer you delay getting them involved, the harder it's gonna be to recover any of those funds. If you have any questions regarding these articles and how, or how they might affect your company, uh, you can definitely get a hold of me by sending me a direct message or scheduling a, a discussion. Uh, I'll post a link in the chat that, uh, that you can schedule something with me. Uh, let's see, comments. I don't see any, any questions or comments that have come through live. So if you're watching this later on and have any, um, feel free to, to, to add a comment or send me a direct message, or you can always go on our website at itnet.works. Um, we do have an upcoming live webinar. We had one yesterday, uh, amazing webinar yesterday. We had Total, um, Darren Swan, the CEO of, of Total, we're talking about zero trust. Uh, if you don't know what zero trust is and don't have zero trust implemented in your company, I highly recommend you check that out. Um, and learn more about it and about how zero trust methodologies and zero trust applications can help protect your business and your data. Our next webinar, we're going to be talking about artificial intelligence, right? AI. It can bring tremendous value to your company if implemented correctly, which is why AI, AI execution should be a carefully thought out process. Otherwise, it could be a, a costly headache. Uh, so our team is going to help you understand what some of those potential hurdles are in our upcoming July educational webinar. Uh, we'll be on July 20th at 1 p.m. Pacific time. And we're gonna be talking, as I, as I mentioned, about the current state of AI and answer some questions on how your business can utilize it for your needs. Uh, so you can save the date by following the link in chat and comments. Uh, so you can add it to your calendar of choice. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, thanks for watching. Uh, hopefully you find this informational. If you do, give me a, give me a thumbs up in the comments uh, or, uh, let me know, right? If there's a specific topic that you'd like to hear about, um, we'd love to take requests. Uh, thanks for joining. If you have any other questions or comments, reach out. If not, have a good weekend and we'll see you next week.